Well, good morning. And I have to start by saying a big congratulations to my fellow T12ers this year. And I also want to say thanks to the person or persons who nominated me. And also, thanks to the tremendous staff at CNEN. They, this production is impressive, and I thank you for the honor. I'm sincerely honored. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about sulfur, which is the central focus of the work that I do. And it is elemental. However, before I get there, I have to point out the mentorship I've received. I have had some tremendous uh, science research mentors, and they started with Linda Abriola. When I was at the University of Michigan, I worked in her environmental engineering lab. Uh, I had finished at Michigan working in the laboratory of Professor Vincent Pecorero. Chris Hersina was my first advisor at Purdue University. I got a biochemistry master's degree out of her lab. I really learned how to give good research talks from her. Professor Tong Ren was my PhD advisor, who has been an amazing advisor, not just while I was in his lab, but very supportive afterward. Professor Frances Ligler is my friend. I absolutely love her. She was my postdoc advisor at the Naval Research Lab. And the thing that impresses me the most about her is that despite her tremendous accomplishments, including being a pioneer in biosensors, she's incredibly humble. And um, humble in, even in how she conducts her research. So I have to give her a lot of credit. That's my buddy. Um, and Dr. Jess Sanger is my branch at currently at the Naval Research Laboratory. And the thing that, that sticks out the most to me about him is he understands the science at an incredible depth level, but he is equally as shrewd as a scientific businessman. It's very impressive. He has scores of patents, and scores of those patents have been actually licensed out to industry. So learning a lot from him. So why did I choose to become a scientist? Why am I doing science at all? I have to say my first mentors of my parents, my very uh, loving parents, and these are my three siblings. That's me down there. I know I'm real handsome back then, right? Anyhow, my parents were uh, very interested in making sure we had a, a very broad scope of the world. And one of the things they introduced us, all four of us, to was science. Now, I'm the only scientist today, but they had us in this program called the Hands-On Science Program that was um, at Western Michigan University in my hometown, the metropolis of Kalamazoo, Michigan. And that program was uh, awesome in introducing us to science. I have to just thank them. I thank my siblings. I've learned quite a bit from them as well. I do also want to say that my, my wonderful wife, she's rubbing off on me, and I'm rubbing off on her with some of the fun and often crazy science that I do, too. So I couldn't be here today without her support. Um, so the hands-on science program that I mentioned a moment ago was led by this gentleman. His name was Dr. Leroy Ray. He passed away in 2013. But Dr. Ray, for the course uh, from sometime in the early 70s all the way, I think, to maybe about the year 2000, ran this program. And that program, um, during the school year, you would take uh, chemistry, physics, biology, and computer science on a Saturday morning when I much would have rather been playing sports or watching cartoons. During the summer, this program, he had a farm, and so we learned about agriculture, botany, and the biology of plants and farm animals on his farm. So we learned so much. But the thing that's really important was this was Dr. Ray. And uh, to see a black man with that title that was distinguished like that was very influential for me. And he influenced thousands of young people. I have many friends today who could point to that program as being useful and helpful to them. And so one of the things I have tried to do is mimic in my own way uh, what he's been doing, what he did for us at that time. And so I was looking last year on the internet I was like, whatever happened to the program? And so I stumbled upon this article from the Associated Press. It actually was published in the Los Angeles Times. And uh, it was about his farm. And I actually was reading through it. And I came across a name. And right there, Courtney Boyd. I'm like, that's my sister. And uh, so she got interviewed. And actually, when I read this, I was like, you know, I vaguely remember out at the farm one day, there was a reporter there. And they had my sister. And they were interviewing her. And uh, down here, this bottom line here says, her 11-year-old brother wants to become a paleontologist. I was like, yo, that's me. That's me. <laughs> When I, from the time I was like four or five, I used to always tell people, I'm going to be a paleontologist. I hadn't even seen Jurassic Park. This is just what I always told people. Now, it didn't, didn't quite work out that way, but I was so thankful for them. But anyhow, I want to do something like what that program did for me, which is to introduce youngsters to science and let them know that if science is something that you're interested in, you don't have to be a researcher, you don't have to be a professor, but if you can be a science communicator or somewhere in that sphere, if that's something that you're interested in, um, I want to encourage young folks to do that. And so I started a website, I have a YouTube channel, you can check it out, and hopefully I'm helping. Anyhow, back to that whole paleontology thing. Dinosaurs are extinct, right? No human being ever saw a living dinosaur. Just food for thought. Their bones are still here, though, right? So we're still discovering their fossils even after all this time. What does that mean? That means that the things that we do today have an impact that will last 
much longer than our lifetimes, okay? It means we only have one planet, we have to take care of it. And so I deal in polymers, and I'm using the term today polymers and plastics interchangeably, understanding that not all polymers are plastic, but bear with me with that point. In any case, um, Plastics are in the news because they've been quite damaging. We throw them out and, and we think they're just gone, but no, then they go into the environment somehow, sometimes in the ocean, sometimes into the grass and the ground. And consider this, since they were first mass produced, 8.3 billion metric tons have been created. Of that, 6.3 billion, so much more than half of it, is waste, all right? We only recycle less than 10%, all right? However, no matter how green you are or think you are, we all necessarily use plastics every day, certainly in the so-called developed world. And so it's in the packaging for our food, right? It's in our clothes. We have these polymers in our clothing. Okay, what happens? And there's been a lot of great reporting actually in CNN about what happens to clothes, for example, going into the environment. So Roughly a third of us use in packaging, another third in buildings. If you got here in any kind of automobile, even if you took a skateboard or a bike, you know, the tires are rubber or they're made of some kind of plastic. Those are polymers, um, rubber is. We all need them to survive. So what I'm thinking is we need to rethink plastics. And there, is been a, there has been a groundswell of rethinking plastics. So one of the things that's been in the news quite a bit lately is these straws, right? Plastic straws, and plastic straws are terrible. They're really bad, right? At least that's what we're being told. Now, my thinking is not quite that way. I think uh, plastic straws can be very useful. Plastics have properties that other materials don't have that make them useful. And if you've spoken to some people who are, have particular disabilities, you'll know that the plastic straws are actually superior to some of the other forms of straws, and they really need them in order to imbibe fluids. All right, it's a necessity. It's not just a luxury for everyone. And so, indeed, we can make them out of paper or hay or metal. And um, that is useful too, certainly we should use alternatives. However, I'm thinking we can just do plastics better, which means then we can make plastic straws out of materials that are uh, from renewable sources, but also when we discard them, they actually degrade in a way that is not harmful to the environment. So just food for thought, I'll use that as a segue to talk about the plastics I make, which are from this super molecule sulfur here. And uh, I started with sulfur research through the the perspective of thiol click chemistry. Thiols have sulfhydro groups on them. And I was doing microfluidic works where I was making polymers that had unique cross-section shapes and doing some surface chemistry during my postdoc. I've expanded now into making thiol click nanocomposites, which means I'm adding things like gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles, and quantum dots to the materials in order to make them multifunctional. But today I'm gonna to spend the majority of the talk or the rest of the talk talking about elemental sulfur and these polymers we're making that are optically useful called Ormal chalks, all right? Organically modified chalcogenide polymers. I'll, I'll take the moment there to say, I work primarily with engineers and physicists and they pronounce this term chalcogen or chalcogenide. Now, I'm a chemist and most chemists I know pronounce the term chalcogenide, right? But I've adopted their nomenclature because I work with them, so. Anyhow, ormal chalks, that also has a uh, precedent. There's these things in the sol gel community called ormal sills, organically modified silicon. So um, that's where we got the nomenclature from. But sulfur itself is incredibly abundant, very abundant. And uh, it's been known since antiquity, it's in our body, and cysteine and methionine and amino acids. But today it's primarily obtained from the refining of oil. So if you go to an oil refinery, the, the fields are flooded with these large stockpiles, this is about 100 feet tall, these stockpiles of sulfur, it just sits there, it's benign, but we keep producing it, which means that it's taking up plots of lands where uh, animals and plants used to be, okay? It's benign for the most part. If it mixes with something, though, sometimes it can be toxic. So what are we gonna do with it? Well, sulfur is well known to exist primarily in a, a eight-membered ring. If you heat it up, it actually opens up but the problem with sulfur is when, it, when you heat it, it goes from this yellow stuff to a, a liquid, this molten orange, and then it, instead of evaporating away like most liquids will do if you keep heating, it actually kind of forms like a polymer that is solid-like. Well, that polymer is very optically interesting and useful, except the fact that when you cool it back down, it goes right back to being this yellow powder that is benign. So uh, a group out of the University of Arizona back in 2013, they published a paper in which they pointed out, well, if you could add something that had po uh, multiple vinyl groups, you actually can make it stable. So we've gone ahead and done that. Now, in, at the Naval Research Lab, what I have uh, been working on the last couple of years, I should say in our branch, we have tons of applications for technologies that are optically important. 
Um, but when I joined the group, I said, well, what are you guys making? Well, they make chalk glasses, chalcogenic glasses. And the way they do it is they take sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. Those are the chalcogens for those who are not chemically inclined. Um, and add other elements to them to get properties on them that are unique out in the infrared region of the light spectrum, including the halogens. We also do some laser work where we do some F-block chemistry. But in any case, these chalcogen glasses are what we call infrared transmissive. Now, uh, in general terms, what that means is, well, think night vision goggles, right? Can you see at night? And some of these materials will allow you to do that. And so they've been very successful for the last three decades at making these chalcogenite glasses that are optically useful. However, as a polymer chemist, I'm like, well, if we can make something with sulfur that's a glass, what if we can do it and make it a polymer? And I, we looked at this process from the University of Arizona. They called that process inverse vulcanization. I said, well, what if we add selenium to sulfur or tellurium to sulfur? Can we enhance the properties of these materials to make them even better infrared optics? Well, why would we do that? As you go down the periodic table from sulfur to tellurium, you actually increase in polarizability. What this means is that your refractive indices will be greater. For people like me who wear glasses, I have contacts in today, but when I was younger, I wore these really, really thick glasses because my eyesight's really poor. Well, I remember at some point my glasses needed to be stronger, but they had a material that made them even thinner. That was because the refractive index of the material was greater. So um, when you increase the refractive index, it means that you can make the material even thinner without using as much material. You've increased the focusing power. So that's why you would want to add them. Also, in terms of infrared transmission, um, as you go from sulfur to tellurium, your transmission actually shifts further into the infrared. So now you can see out in the dark or into regions that we normally can't see as human beings. And so these are valuable and useful properties. So we've gone ahead and done that, actually. We've taken sulfur, mixed it with selenium, mixed it with tellurium to actually make these particular, these ormal chalk polymers that are really nice and pretty and allow us to see in the infrared. So this is an FTR plot of, of some uh, so through one of these polymers, this is out in the mid-wave, what we call the mid-wave infrared region. And so not only have, are we able to see in the mid-wave with these polymers, kind of like what we've done in the glasses, but we also have these materials, as was mentioned in the intro, with really high refractive indices. And indeed, uh, this value here, as far as we know, there is no polymer without additives like nanoparticles in it with a value better than that in the infrared of 2.257. And so what this means overall is we're able to make materials, poly polymeric materials that are lighter, they're cheaper, and they're easier to process than the chalcogenite glasses, but they have very similar properties, and that's very useful. So with that, I do just want to thank all of my group members that I've worked with. Thank again my mentors I mentioned before. These five people I'm mentioning here are also people I consider mentors, despite the fact I've never worked in their lab, never worked for them or with them in any way, but they've reached out to me and helped me out a ton. Also, again, we'll thank, uh, honor Dr. Ray's memory. And Dr. Brenda Earhart was at the Kalamazoo Area Mathematics Science Center. She used to stick around when I was in high school and help us with some of the tough classes we took there. And Miss Sherry Fuller was a good family friend now, but she was like the right arm person for Dr. Ray in terms of the hands-on science program. I want to thank my funding sources, and again, thank you all for being here today. <laughs>